Hi gardeners, Morgan from 3000 Acres here, coming to you live from Reservoir to talk a little bit about water solutions for the productive garden on this cold, wintry Melbourne day. So the reason that I wanted to do this short video about water solutions for productive gardens is this is something I have struggled with for years, including as a rental gardener, about how not to spend a mint on watering your garden, because as we all know, productive gardens in particular are very, very water hungry. This is something we're thinking about now because increasingly we are living in a uh, drier climate uh, with the effects of climate change here in Melbourne and we have to be prepared for a time where water restrictions might hit again and there might be restrictions on whether or not you can water your fruit trees and your productive garden. So getting ready for that now and thinking about ways to preserve water for the environment and for your hip pocket are well worth it. So the solutions that I wanted to talk through really quickly are some things to think about in terms of mains water, in terms of collecting water um, through a tank, rainwater, and also a grey water system, which is something I'm lucky enough to be using in this house here. So in talking about each of those in turn, I really want to leave you with some resources to go away and continue doing a little bit of research about what water solutions might work for you. But let's kick off by talking about mains water. And of course, when I say mains water, I'm talking about the water that comes out of your tap in your house and equally out of your tap in your garden. That's water direct to your house that you're paying for through a, a local water service. Now, of course, the consequence uh, with mains water is that you are paying for it, but in some way you're paying for all different water systems, whether that's through the infrastructure cost or some of the maintenance. But mains water in particular can cost quite a lot of money. So things to think about are how can you reduce the amount that you're using? So that can include, for example, strategically not watering in the hottest part of the day where evaporation is gonna take some of that water away, or the big one I find that newbie gardeners miss, which is that you don't need to water the whole plant. In most cases, the plants are requiring their water at their roots. And so by directing the water to their roots, you can save a lot of the water that's just being sprayed through the air with a hose. That's true if you're watering by hand. Hand watering can be great because it gives you an opportunity to assess whether or not the garden actually needs the water, where you can do a, a handy little trick of testing whether or not the soil is still moist. A lot of people are always asking, how do I know if the garden has had enough water? And I recommend you use a highly refined tool of your index finger. That is that you stick your finger into the soil and you see whether or not it's moist down to that second knuckle. Whether or not, even if it's dried out just a tiny bit on the top, there's actually some moisture hanging into the soil underneath. Now, by um, doing those tests, but also by getting out in the garden and watering by hand, you have an opportunity to, to do some pest management, to see what's going right and wrong in the garden. So that can be great. But on top of that, there are solutions if say you're a little bit more time poor, or you really wanna make sure that you're directing right to the roots. Drip irrigation systems can be really successful at helping to constrain the amount of water that you're using in your garden. And as the garden grows, really helpful at constraining the amount of time you spend watering in summer as well which we all know can be a massive drain. The other thing that you can do with mains water, and this is true of all watering systems, to reduce how much water you need, is make sure that your soil can retain water, that it's full of organic nutrients that are able to ensure that that soil has good water retention. By adding compost and fertilizers, uh, manures, then you're able to make sure that that soil is able to hang on to a lot of the water. Next, I wanted to talk really briefly about water tanks or collecting rainwater, which many people know from the Millennium Drought is a great solution even in the home garden. And there are solutions even if you're a renter and are going to need to move your tank over a period of time. The one thing I want you to remember though is that that tank, in order to produce it, did cost a lot of energy and water. So a lot of inputs went into producing that tank, so we need to make sure that we use it well to make it worthwhile to have on the home scale. So when we keep that in mind, it can make us think critically about the materials that go into the tank, whether or not it's movable when we are leaving the house, if it's going to be used for a long time, and also where its placement might be in the garden of whether or not we need, to, uh, need it to be gravity fed or have some sort of pump to get the water out to your productive garden. So I could talk for days about rainwater tanks, but there's actually a really good resource out there that I wanna point you to. I was very lucky my friend Kat Labors pointed me to this one because it's helped me make solution, come up with a solution for my house. There's a site called Tankulator. It is free to use. It helps you calculate how much water you can get off of your roof catchment 
but also it gives you a lot of considerations of what sort of material of tank would you like for your garden. So I'll add a lot of these resources into the comments on this video, but do check out Tankulator. I highly, highly recommend that one if you're thinking about a rainwater tank. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention with rainwater tanks to consider is that it's not just your roof that you can collect rainwater off of. So for example, at my house, I also have a shed, I have a greenhouse that I'll eventually be collecting off, and the chicken house as well. So by having different systems in different parts of the garden, you can group some plants and potentially have them be totally reliant on that tank water in different spots. So think creatively about the roof catchments you have at your site. Now the next source of water that I wanted to talk about, and one that I'm very passionate about because I find it's a little misunderstood, is grey water. Now when we talk about grey water, what that is, is any source of household water that isn't coming out of the toilet. So that's black water, it's not usable uh, unless we do some really, really serious treatment. But grey water is talking about all the other sources of water in the house. Think your washing machine, your sinks, your shower. All of these are sending water down into the drain that was this beautiful resource and can potentially be used in your household garden. Now I need to put a big caveat on this, that there are some health risks to grey water which are serious and should be taken seriously, as well as some government restrictions about how grey water can be used and managed because of those dangers, but absolutely it can be a resource for your garden and that includes for your productive garden. Really what I'm talking about there though, unless you're treating the water, uh, which is a whole other process, is for fruit trees. Fruit trees can absolutely be sustained on grey water with some caveats and so I highly recommend considering it for that. The easiest sources of grey water in your house are generally your washing machine and your shower bathtub. And there's a few reasons for that but the main is that you can really control the amount of uh, dangerously soiled materials that are going through them. So for example in your kitchen sink the risk is coming from uh, the meats that you're washing in there and the fats that are going through the drain, which can pose all sorts of problems. And so a lot of the time kitchen sink materials are, or kitchen sink water is actually referred to as dark gray water. The same is true of your washing machine if you're washing heavily soiled nappies, for example, that's also a dark gray water and is not going to suit for use on your garden without heavy treatment. But if you live in a household like mine where we don't have nappies and we can control, for example, the shampoos we're using in the shower, the detergents we're using in our washing machine, those two sources are very easily redirected to the garden. And that can be a system anywhere from having a bucket in the shower, which gets carried out onto the garden and put onto the fruit trees, to a more advanced treatment system. The systems for grey water can be enormously complex or very, very simple. At my household, it was just a matter of plumbing in so that we have a simple dial when we want to turn grey water on or off to the garden. For example, if it's really wet outside already, I can turn it off and it goes to sewer instead. If the garden is in need of it, I can turn it back on and out it goes to the fruit trees. So a very simple solution and it only cost us um, the cost of the materials in plumbing. So what I really want to recommend with grey water is this resource here creating an oasis with grey water. It's a book written by Art Ludwig for a US audience, but I find it carries through to Australia just fine, and this is an absolute resource. It's very short, very straightforward about the considerations for grey water for your home. There's also an online video, same name, creating an oasis with grey water, which walks you through all the steps to consider when using grey water safely. And that includes all of the advice, like whether um, not being able to touch the grey water, whether or not it requires treatment, not to have it in sprinklers. And what I really want to emphasize here is there are a lot of considerations, but once you get a simple solution right, you'll have absolutely no problems. So I highly recommend this resource. You can see I actually got this one from the library. City of Yarra Libraries does have a copy. Currently it's at my house, but when libraries are open back up, I'll be able to return that one and uh, you don't have to be a City of Yarra resident to, in order to get this one out, so I highly recommend that. The other resource that I found really useful was Gardening Australia recently did a clip at Josh's house about grey water, including, for example, some of the fruit trees at his house that have flourished off his grey water, grey water system, which includes pomegranates and his citrus trees with a little bit of treatment. So I'll post that clip in the comments below, but look up Gardening Australia Grey Water and that's a really short look at the easy and the complex solutions. Everywhere from 
$100 all the way up to several thousand dollars in treatment systems. The other two resources that I highly recommend checking out for all things productive gardens and watering would be My Smart Garden, and I'll post a link as well uh, below in the comments. They've done a lot of really great resources on preserving water, conserving water in the garden, and Sustainable Gardening Australia, who a couple years ago did some videos including about watering solutions for renters, which I know is a big consideration. So please do keep any of your questions coming. What I'm gonna do now is type all of those resources into the comments so that you can have a look for yourself. I recommend checking out whether or not a gray water solution or a water tank solution could work for your house. It can definitely save you money in the long road and it makes you think a lot more critically about the water that goes into your garden. So highly recommend those. Please do post any comments and questions just below and I'll respond to those during the week. For now, see you next time.